I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're going to do a little time traveling. We're going to travel back to the 1960s and 1970s, an era known as the Vietnam War era. Drew Mendelson has written a terrific series of books on the Vietnam War. The one we'll be discussing today, along with the others, this one's called A Shepherd to Fools. It is written by Drew Mendelson, and we are delighted to have him here as a guest on Spotlight. And we'd like to thank the folks at Good River Print and Media for helping us put Drew in the spotlight today. And that is the book. It's a good looking book. And I thoroughly enjoyed it, Drew. Tell me a little bit, or at least let's tell the audience a little bit what the book is all about. Okay. The uh, Shepherd to Fools, which came out in 2021, is the second book of my Vietnam War trilogy that began with Song Bateau that came out in 2010. And we'll conclude with Poke the Dragon, the story I'm writing right now. The title comes from a stanza of a poem by the great Rudyard Kipling. And it goes, I was a shepherd to fools, causelessly bold or afraid. They would not abide by my rules, yet they escaped, for I stayed. The implication being that he was killed in the in the battle to save these others. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Shepherd to Fools is set right at the kind of ragged end of the Vietnam War. Um, the U.S. was looking for ways to try to get out of the war, try to get away from it. And they also were very worried about U.S. deserters who were called long shadows. They called them long shadows because they were taller than the Vietnamese and cast a longer shadow. Mm. Um, looking for scapegoats, the U.S. commanders sent a covert hatchet team uh, into southern Laos to find, capture, and bring American deserters to trial. An earlier attempt failed disastrously. The uh, story here is kind of based on that first story, but with, uh, you know, I wanted it to be a tougher story. And so I, uh, I went beyond just the fiction of it into uh, um, more of what the possibility was. They go after the, these American deserters. They finally uh, uh, find them, but can't catch them. They end up uh, running into a, a large battle with um, Laotian and um, North Vietnamese troops. And uh, in the uh, middle of this battle, the North Vietnamese use sarin gas, which if you recall from a, a story about India about this time, was one of the worst of the worst of the, of the uh, devices used in the, the Vietnam War, and uh, they uh, finally survived, but barely. A number of them are killed. A number on the other side are killed, and uh, that is a uh, true piece of what actually happened during the uh, first battle that uh, took place there. And uh, they, um, this story is what might have happened if there had been a se second attempt. So that that's kind of where we are with the story. Uh, it's a wonderful story. It's very real. And it begs the question, are you a Vietnam War veteran? How do you know all this stuff? A, yes, I'm a Vietnam War veteran. I spent a year in Vietnam. I was an artillery officer. Um, I spent a half, six months out in the jungle with an infantry company um, as the uh, forward observer for them. Forward observer's job was to provide artillery support if they got into a big mess, into a big battle. Um, and then I spent my second six months doing the same thing. But instead of doing it for an infantry company, I did it for an infantry battalion of about 1,200 men. And uh, my job was to provide artillery support if they got into big battles. So that, that was what I did in Vietnam. Spent a year there. Well, that's a long time. A year in Vietnam is like uh, 10 years any other place, I'd say, for sure. Yeah, sure. You know, it's funny when you talk about, first of all, were you drafted? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, I was dumb. I was going to UC Berkeley at the time and dropped out to be a war protester. And the only action that I got then was that I got drafted for, for protesting the war. You would have and, gotten a deferment probably if he had stayed in school, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I sure would have. But, uh, you know, I think it was important to learn about the war, to learn about what was going on. I don't think many Americans really know just, uh, what kind of a war we had. It was, it was horrendous. It was, at the uh, peak of the war, there were about almost 600,000 American troops in the field. Um, a large number of them got killed. A, new, a much larger number of the uh, North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese got killed. And uh, it, it was it was just a mess for uh, um, about 
Well, the 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 war really started right at the end of World War II. Mm. It was clear back in the uh, very late 1940s. They uh, were supporting the French, who uh, had their own war there in Vietnam, and they uh, um, really sent in American troops to act as advisors to the French. The French, after the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, um, dropped out entirely, turned the war over to the U.S., and uh, the the war just uh, got ugly from there. You know, I picture you, a young man over there, you're what, 19, 20 years old, 21? I was uh, a little older than that. I was uh, 23 when I got to Vietnam, so I was an old man. So you're an old man at the age of 23 over there, taken away from sunny California and put into the jungles of Vietnam where there are bugs and snakes and and people trying to kill you, literally. Did you ever wonder, how the hell am I going to survive this? I wondered that about uh, <clears throat> for about 10 minutes every morning when I woke up. And I thank, thank the Lord at the end of the day that I was still there. So it was, uh, it, it was, it was a horrendous mess. And uh, we, we got into some battles so big that uh, I think here, here more than 50 years later, I still think about them. Um, oh, sure. We uh, were in a, a battle that uh, um, cost us about uh, a tenth of the infantry company of guys killed. About another uh, 15 to 20 were uh, mortally wounded or badly wounded. And uh, that was the worst battle that we were in. And I still think about that one all these years later. Yeah. I mean, when you think about the state of young men today, I can't imagine 21-year-olds, 23-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. I know that you've got the guys that enlist, and thank God for them. But I'm talking about guys who never dreamed of fighting a war, being told by their country, you're going to war or we're going to put you in jail. Put that into 2020 to 2023 terms. Can you imagine that happening today? Well, well, first of all, there's no draft now. Right. You you can join if you want. And you uh, and, you know, I, I believe in the importance of supporting the country that you live in. And I I I firmly believed after I got to Vietnam and kind of figured things out that I was doing an important job. My job was to help people survive. I was I was not necessarily an an active offensive combat officer, but I was there to provide support to keep these guys protected. And uh, it it was it was a situation that I, I guess I didn't really think about when I first first got there. I was drafted. I was angry about it. I I was angry at myself for being stupid enough not to uh, stay out and stay in school. But uh, once I had done that, I I really realized that it was important to try to provide some real protection for American troops that were there. And uh, that's most of what I did for about a year. Yeah. And the mission becomes different once you're there. It's not about the overall cause of the war. It's about keeping the guys around you alive and keeping yourself alive. Oh yeah, that was that was absolutely it. And uh, once, if you had to think any bigger than that, um, you were really beyond your depth. If you know, as an artillery lieutenant out there in the field, my job was the guy in the foxhole next to me was the uh, guy that uh, shared my tent with me was was the uh, artillery um, that was shooting for us was the infantry commander who was supporting the uh, troops in the field, and uh, we were out there pretty much by ourselves. The the war. Um, had uh, comparison to Afghanistan or other wars that people see today, had uh, a lot of troops, but not nearly as many as uh, you needed for a big country like Vietnam. You know, seven, seven, eight hundred miles long, um, a uh, place that uh, you could really get lost in if if you uh, didn't didn't think about it at all. Absolutely, absolutely. And what year was it that you served? Or what years? Okay, I was there. In uh, from August of sixty nine to August of seventy, so that's and, uh, the height of the war. Yeah, that was that was the largest uh, deployment that we had. There were almost six hundred thousand U.S. troops out in the field at that point. Um, there were about um, maybe five hundred thousand when I first got there, and we had dropped back to about four hundred and fifty thousand by the time I left. But at the at the height of it, there were at least six hundred thousand troops. 
What was it like when you came back? I know we hear a lot, and I, I grew up in that era. I was a kid. I grew up in, I was born in 62. So I grew up in that era. My mother scared to death that I'd be drafted, very happy that I was flat footed. And, uh, and, uh, but what was it like when you came home? Well, it, it was interesting for me. I, I wasn't from California. I grew up in Kansas City. I was born there and I left Kansas City when I was 18 to come to UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, when I went back, really my home and the people that I knew were all in Kansas City. So I went back there and uh, nobody really had much to say. People, you know, people would take me aside and say, what was it like? What was the war like? But uh, nobody was angry about my serving or angry about what the war was like. I came back to California after a couple of years and the war was still going on. And people were, you know, some people that didn't like the war really took it very personally that I had fought there as if I was responsible for the war. And uh, that was that was that was a, that was truly crazy. Um, fairly, fairly soon after that, I uh, just um, only talked to people that I really knew that I could trust to, to tell the stories that we had. And then uh, finally, I, I just quit that and went on with my life. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of soldiers wind up keeping what they experienced and what they lived through to themselves, because unless you were there, it's kind of hard to understand. That I, I think that's absolutely true, because, you know, it, it is it, the one thing that people understood and were terrified about was that it was fairly easy to get killed if you weren't careful. Um, you uh, didn't pay attention one morning when you when you went out uh, to. Uh, um, get dressed and get get back on the line to get ready to move. And uh, you took one wrong step, and they had the uh, Viet Cong had planted a uh, grenade or a claymore mine or something mm -hmm. that that night before. And the next thing you didn't know was that you were gone. And that that was that was fairly fairly easy to do. So you you had to be careful at that. But at the at the same token, if that's all you thought about, you weren't careful about anything else. So you could easily get killed another way. Um, and it is it is hard to imagine people who have not been in combat understanding what it's all about, because, you know, there there's certainly fear and there is uh, certainly um, preparation for it. But for the most part, it's just trying to avoid thinking about what you don't want to think about, because there's nothing you can do about it. Right. Absolutely. We talk a lot about equity nowadays. Uh, do you think it would be more equitable if there was a draft that the burden of defending the country just didn't fall upon some, but fell upon most or all? Yes. I, I have long believed that uh, you, if you have a country, everyone needs to support what the country is doing and what you believe in that the country is doing and that uh, we ought to have a draft. And, uh, you know, it, to me, it's, it doesn't matter whether they go into the military or they, they uh, serve, serve their time as a teacher or serve their time in some other ways. But I think it is important to demonstrate your support for the country that you are from and uh, to do uh, some important action that uh, shows that shows that support. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I know the um, experience of Vietnam obviously influenced your work, and we're going to get to that again in just a second. But do you feel like it also shaped your life? It, it certainly shaped it for a long time. I um, when I when I got back from Vietnam and after I'd been home for a couple of years, I went back to school. I had dropped out of UC Berkeley and I I decided it was just going to do me no good to have to have half of a, a bachelor's degree. Mm. Um, and so I uh, came back out here to California and uh, went all the way through a master's degree in uh, creative writing, mm. which, uh, was, which was valuable in helping me write fiction. And uh, this is uh, my uh, sixth novel right here. So I, I uh, thought that it was uh, important to do that. But it gave me uh, a uh, kind of a calling, something that I could uh, hang hang my hat on. I uh, became a, a, a journalist mm. and I worked for small newspapers. I, I never worked for a really big paper. The biggest paper I worked for I had four people with. And uh, that was that was in uh, Lancaster, Missouri, the uh, Lancaster Excelsior 
which was a very small paper. But Four people I, is considered a large editorial staff nowadays, Drew. Well, I, th I think so. If you look here, we have the Sacramento Bee, and uh, the Sacramento Bee has shrunk to the point that, it, it, you know, it's still an important newspaper, but it's not a tenth as important as it was 20 years ago. No, and, it, uh, it's amazing how newspapers have changed. I mean, there was a beat for every, there were a reporter for every beat that you could possibly think of, and that the real source of information for even television journalists were going through the newspapers because you had the staff to fully investigate and fully ferret out information. And uh, something's missing with our journalistic experience now that these smaller, mid-sized newspapers have, if they haven't folded up, they're just basically, you know, rip and read and rip or write from the AP. I, oh, I know. It's, it is uh, scary to think of that. And, you know, when I studied journalism, and I can't speak for what it's like today, but when I studied journalism, we really had to learn how to write well. You had to learn how to, how to craft a story that was shortened to the point, but that told a story that was powerful enough to grab the readers. Mm. And uh, I, I don't know that they have the time to even think about that today. If you've got a paper that's a quarter the size it was 20 years ago, and that's headed down because they just don't have the money to keep it, keep it big, you have lost a sizable portion of your audience who doesn't care because there, there's no detail. And uh, it it ends up just being another thing that you read every day. And that's about it. Exactly. Exactly. And also the statements that are made by journalists today are absolutely shocking to me. I'm sure you have the same experience. It'll No matter who the politician is, it'll say, you know, um, despite Trump's lies, I'll say Trump as an example, Maybe Trump lied, maybe he didn't, but as a journalist, we always put the special word there, allegedly. You know, yeah. attribution and, you know, giving both sides of the story seems to have gone out the wayside. Well, I, I, I find that, frankly, frightening um, because if you don't know both sides of the story, you can't be a, can't be a responsible citizen. Exactly. You can't, you can't go out and vote and decide who you're voting for based upon half of the knowledge you're supposed to have, that's yeah. dangerous. Yeah, advocacy journalism, which is taught now in almost every journalism school, is the antithesis to journalism because journalists shouldn't be advocates of anything other than presenting the story, presenting all sides. I, I agree, I agree completely. And that's, that's what I went into when I became a journalist and hoped that I would see that 50 years later, it's impossible to say what what uh, ought to be, but it's clear that what we've got is not nearly what we need. Exactly, exactly. Let's talk about writing your books, this trilogy about the Vietnam War. What was it like traveling back in your head to this era? I imagine some of these very realistic soldiers that we meet in your story are people, are modeled after people you met and knew. Uh, is that presumption correct? Oh, yeah, that's absolutely true. Let me show you just very quickly the uh, cover. And I'm sorry this flips around backwards, but this says Song Bateau. Mm -hmm. That was that was my first Vietnam War novel. Yeah, I liked the cover. I did the cover. And I, it's wonderful. I, I liked it. Um, and uh, that one was based almost entirely on my own experiences there. About 85 to 90 percent of it is what I what I saw and felt and uh, um, ran toward or ran away from just about every day to uh, stay alive. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the difference between this and the other ones was not so much what happened, but the reality of what happened and the fact that you um, kind of sit and think, I got through another day. I'm I'm alive. Let me turn that off. I'm That's I'm a fan club calling you already. Yeah, I think I I <laughs> hope so. Uh, you know, but uh, it it was just a, a situation where I thought that people really needed to know the story. And if you're you know if your dad or your grandfather was fighting in World War II, you heard a lot about it. I mean that that was an important war to the United States. Vietnam was not an important war politically for us. It was an important war because they decided that we needed to defend this, this uh, country in, uh, 
Asia for it. So it was, it was very different in the in the way that worked. Um, I can't think of uh, anything um, that people know about today that is really less in front of them than the Vietnam War is to the average American today. Um, yeah. You know, you you were old enough to at least kind of see what was going on around you and probably had uh, big big brothers of friends of yours that maybe got drafted or such. And that, oh, yeah. that was that was very frightening. Um, just to know that uh, Tommy isn't here anymore. Where'd Tommy go? Well, we can't talk about that. Yeah. And he, but Tommy's not here and he's not coming back. And that was that was something that was scary. But but why Tommy's not here anymore, why this war was important is something that the average American today knows nothing about. It's frankly the reason I wore to Shepherd to Fools, because I wanted to tell about the fact that the United States was really engaged in some very super secret things that they've only begun to talk about today, just, just in the past few years, that uh, could have sent the war in an entirely different direction. Um, I am my newest novel, which is uh, the um, Poke the Dragon. Um, Poke the Dragon comes from a uh, comment by one of the people that was involved in the Manhattan Project um, who uh, were trying to get nuclear weapons ready to defend the U.S. during World War II. And they ultimately used two of them, and that was it, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that, that was all there were. But they wanted to tell a, a powerful story about it. And we had several presidents that I think believed them. Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, uh, when Nixon was president, had a huge debate over whether or not they were going to um, use nuclear weapons in Vietnam. And uh, we had uh, John Kennedy, who disliked uh, Vietnam more intensely, but he had committed himself to it. And I think it's possible that he might have used nuclear weapons. Gerald Ford, who was the last president involved in the war after Nixon resigned, um, we never knew what he would have done, but there's, but there's a big question he, he was asked what he thought about the war, and he basically said, the war's over as far as I'm concerned. We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're done with it. We're going to get out of here. But if uh, the uh, Chinese had invaded, if the Russians had come in, um, that would that would have been a, a very difficult situation to try to battle your way out of. Um, so that was kind of the story that I wanted to tell. And uh, the uh, Song Bateau, the first, the first novel, um, as I said, was almost entirely my own experience. A Shepherd to Fools was based in part on my experiences, but in part on the experiences of a lot of guys that I knew that were there that told me that story and uh, told, me, told me how awful and terrifying it was to be out in the middle of Laos and not know whether you were going to come home alive. And then uh, the uh, um, Poke the Dragon is uh, really a, a story that's entirely fictional, but it's a could have been. And uh, I thought I wanted to finish this, not with what happened, but what could have happened. Absolutely. Well, we're glad you did because you have really encapsulated an important part of history that, as you said, is largely forgotten by Americans and people who uh, forget history are condemned to repeat it, of course. But uh what is your favorite war film of this era? Would it be Full Metal Jacket? Would it be Platoon? What film do you think accurately portrayed it? Well, I think you hit on two of the, two of the biggest ones. Uh, Full Metal Jacket and Platoon were, to me, the most realistic in, in that. Um, the Boys in Company C was a, a third one that was a very powerful movie. But it was powerful for me because it was realistic. It, it showed what people actually felt, what they were involved in, what they had to come to grips with every day in order to stay alive. And that, that was a, a story that uh, um, had to be told. And I think that uh, they did the best, best job of it there. So those, those would be probably the three. The only other one that I would add, and it's, it's really kind of strange, is uh, Dr. Strangelove, mm. which... Uh, it's not about uh, World War II. It's about kind of the beginnings of World War III. But I think the ideas 
of uh, what war begins to mean to people were pretty well explored in, in that movie. Yeah. It's amazing. Like we were talking about how lessons forgotten are lessons that we might be condemned to repeat. When you look at what's happening in Ukraine right now, it's sort of like we're in a proxy war with Russia, don't you think? Oh, I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, you know, I think about it in part because my grandparents and uh, great grandparents came from Ukraine. Mm. They, they lived in a, a small town called Rafalovka, which was uh, fairly near Kiev, about 20 miles away. And uh, they left in, uh, in 1910. Now, that was a long, long time before the uh, uh, what's going on there now. But it was all a precursor. It was all building up. If you watched over time, you realize that uh, Russia, um, especially with Putin, who is a uh, um, someone who very much feels that uh, he didn't want to see the Russia that he liked go away, wanted to become a powerful force in the world again. And uh, he uh, invaded because he thought he could win quickly. And it turned out that his army was a lot worse than the uh, Ukrainians, which have a pretty solid army. They needed weapons, but uh, they had good soldiers. So um, the, the, the result is that you have a uh, war that uh, is going in a completely different direction than people expected. And uh, it's hard to say, especially if the uh, um, current um, administration is gone and somebody new and different takes over in the Washington, D.C., as to whether they will get the support necessary to uh, keep the war to its conclusion. And that's a whole different issue that's powerful. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say which way this should go. I mean, the country of Ukraine is being destroyed. People are being displaced. People are being killed. It's, you're looking at decades of rebuilding at the very least to get it back to what it was, you know, two years ago. Yeah, yeah, no, and uh, I, I don't, I don't know what else they can do. I think the Ukrainians very much believe that uh, they should not be forced to become a vassal state of Russia again. Okay. And uh, they uh, um, believe believe that completely. And they believe in uh, both NATO and U.S. support to uh, keep them from that happening to them. So uh, it, it, it's hard to say where, where you end up here. But uh, it's, it's a war that never should have been and that uh, I, don't, I can't swear what's going to happen a year or two from now. Yeah, it, it's a frightening prospect. Well, War is the topic of the day. We're talking to Drew Mendelson about his trilogy of books. They are called Song Bato, if I'm saying that correctly, am I, Drew? Okay, great. That's the first of the series. The second is one we primarily focused on today, which is Shepherd to Fools. And the third is Hope the Dragon? Hope. 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 Yep. Um, okay. It was Richard Feynman who was the... Uh, um, scientist on the Manhattan Project who said, we've got to poke the dragon until we can find out whether it goes off or not. Gotcha. And, uh, okay. that, that was where the line came from. Okay, wonderful. Well, I enjoyed speaking with you very much. Um, from journalism to war, to your thoughts on the military today, to Ukraine, I think we covered a lot. And uh, you've got a lot of stories to tell, Drew. I think your years of... Uh, a journalist have uh, paid off and uh, the, your your book is rich with stories and knowledge and anecdotes that I think the reader will really enjoy. Thank you very much. And I very much appreciated your time. Today. My pleasure. Thank you for your time. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.